Now, this morning we are going to finish chapter 5, uh, which I expected to be a more simple in presenting to you, but as it's turned out, we've uh, stayed four times, and this is for the final time, in this great Christ-centered chapter, and I uh, defend what I've done or explain what I've done uh, just because of that. It's the chapter that presents to us the Lord Jesus Christ as wonderfully clearly and centrally as any part of Revelation, uh, perhaps with the exception of chapter 19. Uh, But uh, this chapter is all about the uh, lifting up of the Son of Man. It's the the Lord Jesus Christ leaving behind him uh, his suffering and his death and the darkness of the cross and entering into his state of glory Uh, which began with his resurrection and then his ascension into heaven and his sitting down uh, on the throne of the universe, the throne of God his Father. And uh, that is where he is now. And it was that event that caused in chapter 5 here all these different groups of angels and beings to glorify God and to praise the Lamb of God. So, Chapter 5 all hinges, it really pivots on verse 7, where Jesus demonstrates for the first time, as it were, that he is crowned with many crowns, that he is now enthroned in glory, that he is now the ruler of the kings of the earth, that he's the one who's supervening and supervising everything that goes on now in this world. He has it all in hand, in his hands. And that uh, is the extent of his royal authority now. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And that's how this chapter is asking us to picture him and believe in him. We have to keep on believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to believe in him in every step that he took on his journey from Mary's womb to heaven's glory. And uh, our faith is faith in Christ. And so we want to learn about him, hear about him in every step of his journey through this world and back into the glory of his heavenly Father. And we're not finished there, are we? We believe in him for his glorious return. And that's the last step that has to take place for this whole world. And uh, we're looking forward to that, the last step of his redemptive and glorious journey, and uh, we are believing in him. And uh, so, in verse 7, you remember what happens. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, and it was when he had taken the scroll that these three glorious songs burst out, and uh, we identified them, didn't we, first of all, as the church's song, in uh, verses 9 and 10, and uh, remember the second person there, singular, is used. You are, you are, worthy are you to take the scroll. And uh, that's the voice of the church, and that's our voice too, isn't it? We speak in the second person. We address Jesus Christ himself. We have a direct and open line to him. That's what prayer is. That's what our community uh, of faith praises. We address him in person because we've come to know him in person. And so we say, Lord Jesus, you are worthy. That's the language of the church. Now, today we're going to look at the last two songs from verse 11, uh, 11 and 12, which we've called the Song of the Angels. And that is obvious from what is told us in these verses. And then in the last two verses, 13 and 14, we're going to pick up on the song of all creation. The whole creation breaks out into song and rejoicing and hallelujah to the Lamb. And there are differences there, and we're going to pick up on some of the different detail. In the Scriptures, it's often the detail that carries and conveys the blessing to us. So, if we just skim across the surface of Scripture, uh, we'll certainly be blessed, but we'll miss an awful lot of what God intends for us to receive. So, it's in the detail 
that is the blessing. Uh, and I, I believe that's correct in preaching as a preacher. It's in the detail. And everything in Scripture is given from God for us. So that's why we have to take our time and take note of everything that's written here for our instruction and for our encouragement. So we're looking, first of all, at verses 11 and 12, which is the song of the angels. I'll just read it first to remind us all. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and around the living creatures and around the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. So that's the song of the angels, and uh, we want to ponder that and learn from that uh, just now. And my first comment would be, uh, when did you last think about angels? When did you last hear a sermon that mentioned the angels? And I know what the answer to that is, uh, because you're all silent. <laughs> Uh, the, the answer to that is very, very rarely, if ever, and a long time ago, or if I read in the Bible about them as here. So, I want to take this reference in verse 11 as a corrective to us all, and I include myself, that we tend to underestimate the angels. And uh, there are many of them, as we'll see here in a moment, and they're a very important part of the furniture of heaven. Uh, the layout of heaven uh, makes room extensively for the many, many angels of God. So that's the first thing I want us to ponder and receive, that we need to think more about the angels. They're very important servants of God, and they have a place that is given to them in heaven, and they come near to us on earth. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what I've just mentioned also, that there are many of them. Uh, we think the human population is somewhere over six billion, uh, but the way the angels are represented uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, I'm sure we can go beyond that, uh, and John is suggesting that here, isn't he? He's saying thousands upon thousands, myriads of myriads. And uh, in the background here is that parallel passage that we've looked at before, but let's do it again in Daniel 7. And uh, this is the background for John's picture of Christ in these opening chapters and later on too uh, in his visions in Revelation. And uh, he's the son of man. And remember, Jesus loved that title in the first three Gospels. He always, and John's Gospel too indeed, uh, he likes to be called, likes to call himself the son of man. And he's referring back to this vision of Daniel that sets the scene and the background for John. So if we read in Daniel 7 and 9 and 10, as I looked, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And then we have the Son of Man in the verses that follow 13 and 14, presented to the Ancient of Days, as it were in Revelation 5. And uh, he's given dominion, verse 14, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So I hope you can see the parallel between Daniel 7 here, this vision of Daniel hundreds of years before John, and now John's catch-up vision, which enlarges on it and is more focused. There's greater clarity and substance in John's declaration of the heavenly world. 
And uh, that is because the Son of Man has now taken his seat in heaven. He's joined the Heavenly Father on the throne of time and on the throne of the universe. And uh, this is the moment when the angels burst out in song. They're rejoicing. So that's one scene. Now, there's another passage that came to my mind in the Gospel of John, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it's Jesus who's speaking here, just on the same point of the numerous nature of the angels, and that's a poor way to represent it, isn't it? They are just multitudes on multitudes. They cannot be counted. And Jesus, remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter struck the servant of the Roman or the Jewish official, Jesus said, put away your sword. But he also said this, don't you know, Peter, that I am in a position to appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. Now, Jesus knew that all along. And he submitted to Judas. He submitted to the soldiers. He submitted to the high court of the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, during the night. And in the morning, he submitted to, uh, to Pontius Pilate. And they were all fallen men. <laughs> they were all serving their own interests. They were all doing the work of the evil one. But Jesus had come to submit to all that on our behalf. And through his death, to overthrow them all. To throw them off and to defeat them forever. And that is the mystery of the cross of Christ, isn't it? That Jesus defeated his enemies at his weakest moment and in his darkest hours. And because he's the sinless son of God, he was able to do that. So he allowed his enemies to do their worst against him, and still he came out victor. And that's the proof of the resurrection. That's the message of the resurrection. We're re meeting this morning in the presence of the risen Christ, the reigning Christ, the victorious Christ, the coming again Christ. And uh, we worship him. So here is Jesus, and he uh, allows for that too. He knew firsthand, didn't he? He came from heaven. He knew the angels firsthand. There's one other reference I want to mention for you, and that is in Paul as he writes to the Corinthians. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, verse 10, uh, Paul says this, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, verse 10, uh, that is why a wife ought to have authority on her head. And remember, in this passage, he's distinguishing. Uh, we're confusing the sexes and the genders today. Uh, Paul was going in the other direction, God's direction, and, uh, and he builds on the creation of male and female together, but different, complementary, but one. And uh, he says, let the woman have this sign of the authority, I think the authority of her husband, and he gives as a reason to do that because of the angels. So when we meet like this, you may think you're just sitting in a pew here in Balaclava down on planet Earth, but there's an unseen host with us as we worship and gather, and the angels of God are here. And why does Paul mention that? Well, the angels of God know God's ordering of things. And uh, he knows, they know, how Jesus Christ created in the beginning men and women. And uh, that ordering is what the gospel restores and vindicates. And so Paul is saying in this passage, when we come together for worship, we need to be careful how we behave and how we dress. We have to honor our sexuality and our gender identity as God has created that because the angels are here and they know how it was in the beginning. Just like Jesus says in uh, Matthew 19, this is how it was in the beginning. And so the angels are here to encourage us to watch and pray, to be careful how we appear and 
how we treat one another and how we meet together as the covenant people of God. There's order, good order, fixed order in God's created world. So the angels are a witness to that. So these are aspects of the angels that come out of chapter 5. Now they sing to the Lamb, and uh, in verse 12 they say with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive all this power and wealth and wisdom and might. So they're responding, do you see, to what they've just seen happen. The Lamb went up to the Ancient of Days, seated on the throne of glory, and the Lamb takes that scroll. He doesn't snatch it, he takes it, and the Father allows him to take it. This scroll that has the will of God for history, and that's what we'll open up in the next middle chapters of the book of Revelation, and it's the Lamb who will oversee the processes of history. This life on planet earth is ordered by God, and He will see it through, and it's the Lamb who serves Him in that. And as the Lamb does that in verse 7, He went and took the scroll from the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne, and when He had taken the scroll, the many, many glorified angels in heaven cried out with a loud voice, saying, Worthy is the Lamb to receive what this signals, what this uh, action of His uh, makes known to us, that uh, He has now received power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, why are the angels uh, acknowledging the Lamb? After all, we don't believe that Jesus died for angels. The Lamb of God was slain for us men and women. Uh, he was uh, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, a woman, a human being, and He took on human form. He became one of us. He is the God-man to represent us. He's not the God-angel. So, is there some relationship here that we should notice or understand? And the answer to that, I believe, is this, that these angels are not only acknowledging what the Son of God has done as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of His people and to glorify them with Himself forever, but they are also singing His praises because they have been blessed by Him. Now, what do we mean by that? What's the relation, in other words, of the glorified Savior Jesus Christ, this Lamb of God who now sits on the throne of God with the Father. What's the relationship between Him and these angels who sing His glory? Well, there's a clue, and we have to follow up clues in the Scripture, and the clue comes in Paul's letter to Timothy, and uh, it's the fifth chapter of Timothy. And uh, in that reference, uh, he says the following thing, chapter 5 and verse 21. <clears throat> In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect or chosen angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So that's the clue. Paul says there are angels that were chosen. What were they chosen for? Well, they were chosen by God to keep their first position. Now, if you read back into Jude, just turn back a few pages to the letter to Jude. It's the one that comes before Revelation. And in verse 6, we read there, and the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So what does that tell us when we put these verses and references together? We come out with a picture like this, that before ever 
man fell away from God. Some of the angels had fallen away from God, and the root of their rebellion was the discontent, discontent with the position that God had allotted to them. Now, in this picture, we have the angels around the throne, and inside their outer ring, you see, are the living creatures and the 24 elders. So, they're the periphery of heaven. They're guarding the whole, and they're where God put them. They're there to do the will of God wherever He sends them. And remember, Hebrews tells us they're servants of God to those of us who have salvation. I wonder if you've ever sensed the presence and the power of angels in your life, sometimes in extremities of danger or necessity. And uh, many Christians can testify to that. Their ministry is unseen, but it's real. And these are the angels that are and were appointed to the periphery, to the rims of heaven, (laughs) to keep everything in order, and to sustain this song of rejoicing in God our Savior. But, as we will see shortly in the book of Revelation, there is a Satan. There is a Satan. And there are angels who followed Satan in that original sin. Original sin is not really Adam's sin. It's Satan's sin, and it was the sin of pride and ambition to be higher, to be something other that God had appointed him to be, and he persuaded some of the angels to join him in that rebellion. And uh, that's why in chapter 12 and onwards, we're going to read about the dragon and the beast and the false prophet and later on still the corrupting prostitute, which are symbols, you see, for all the dark forces that militate against men and women in this world and against Christians. And if you're a true believer, you'll know something from experience of the misleading and the tempting and the confusing and the hurtful activity of the evil one. We're not fighting against flesh and blood after all, says Paul, Ephesians 6. We're fighting against the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. And they're the explanation for all the moral and spiritual darkness in the world we live in every day. So, we're getting the heart of the matter here. And these are the blessed angels whom Jesus, as the Son of God, chose not to fall into the suggestions of Satan and his followers, but to keep their first estate and to be content to be these angels round the throne and to be God's servants forever right up to our own day and when Jesus comes again with all these holy angels. So, there's a wonderful backdrop here. We only know so much about it from these clues that are given to us, but there's a spiritual world, you see, all around us. These heavenly places where good and evil angels join forces, and we'll see more of that too in chapter 12 and following. So, here we're just acknowledging these angels. Uh, We do believe in them, the Scriptures inform us about them, and uh, there are consequences from that, that we should uh, make a place for them in our lives, in our worldview, and that we would be realistic about the nature of our human dwelling in this world and uh, our, our experience as the Lord's people. So, here is the witness of the angels, and uh, we come now to their song, and uh, we've already read that in verse 12, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, Uh, worthy is the the Lamb who chose us and kept us from falling, and uh, He is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, and glory, 
and blessing. And if you count these ascriptions of the angels, there are seven. Does that surprise you? No, it shouldn't. Uh, seven is the complete number uh, from the seven days of creation onwards. And so, this is part of the symbolism of Revelation here. And when we read back to verse 6, we read that this lamb who suddenly appeared to John after seeing the lion, he has seven horns. And he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So Jesus Christ is the ideal figure, uh, the complete ruler, <laughs> the complete son, uh, and the complete agent of God. And uh, he does all things well. And he completes the work that the Father gave, gave him to do. And he said that on the cross. His last words, it is accomplished. And that's our salvation, that's our hope, that's our security. And uh, he stands among us this morning as the slain lamb who still bears in his appearance the marks of the crucifixion because of what that means for us. And we need to constantly be seeing the marks of the crucifixion because it was for us. And uh, he is our salvation and our atoning sacrifice forever. So they sing this song with a loud voice. And uh, although they're not, uh, and they're complete uh, in the number of blessings that they ascribe to Jesus. And in chapter 19, which is that other uh, passage that reveals the glory of Christ, the rider on the white horse, you remember? I hope we'll be able to come to that. And he appears in his glory there. Uh, freed from all the limitations and the weaknesses of his earthly passion. And on his head are many diadems. So he's the complete ruler. Uh, he's the king of kings indeed and the lord of lords. And uh, he has this awesome authority and uh, the, the angels recognize this. So just before we leave the song of the angels, uh, let me challenge you and ask you about your picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you see Christ? How do you imagine Christ? Uh, who is the Christ that you believe in? Uh, is he the, the lion, or rather the lamb of God, who was slain for us, for you, whose shed blood takes away your sins and offenses? to God forever, so that you are washed and clean in God's sight? And is your picture also of the lion, <laughs> the crowned king of glory? Are you able to believe in him equally as the vindicated Savior? And do you picture him every day as you pray and read the Scriptures or confess your faith in Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Well, he's the king of glory, and uh, he's coming again in that glory. And in the meantime, he rules the world in righteousness and in power. So that's the song of the angels. They're there to instruct us and to encourage us in our Christian faith and to share with them the praises of the Lamb. And now we come to the song of, the, of all creation in verses 13 and 14, and uh, that's made perfectly clear to us in the way that this is worded. I heard every creature or the whole creation, it could be translated as, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying uh, to him who sits on the throne. So this is, a complete in, this is a complete inventory from John. He, he uh, describes the world as he sees it uh, in his period of time. And, and, and of course, scientifically, we can fill in the gaps here. We can imagine it so much more wonderfully uh, in our modern world because of the discoveries of telescopes and science and all kinds of photography. Uh, it's a wonderful world, and it's one world, and it's one world because there is one God and creator, and uh, it's that identity of the one creator God 
that enables us, either as Christian believers or as Christian scientists, to view the universe as a single creation. And you remember in chapter 4 we learned that. Chapter 4 was all about the glory of God, the Creator. And in the last verse it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So we see the world as the handwork of God. And we learn that from the opening chapter of the Bible onwards. And here it is at the end of the Bible. And it's going to become clearer still because the last two chapters of the Bible correspond to the first two chapters of the Bible. The first creation is going to give birth to a second creation minus the sin and the evil and the death and the pain and the darkness. And that is where everything is leading. And that is how God, through Christ, is guiding this present creation, and especially planet Earth. So we don't need to despair. We don't need to be alarmist about the future of this planet. Surely, certainly, we're responsible for its care and its upkeep, but we do not despair. Uh, the, the planet Earth is in the hands of a God who created it, in the hands of a Savior who has died for it, and uh, the future of this planet is secure in the love and in the purpose of God, this one God and Father. And may I draw your attention to the fact that in the song, in verse 13 still, it's not just a song to the Lamb. There's another of the details that speak to us. Uh, that's wonderful, isn't it? This third song is not just to the Lamb, but it's to the Lamb and Him who sits on the throne. And the reason for that is that it was the Father who created the world through His Son. Uh, they're joint, they're co-creators. And so, uh, 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 creation knows that. <laughs> if we can personify creation as Paul does in a passage we're going to look at in a moment, uh, we, uh, we can recognize that the whole creation recognizes <laughs> the fact that many, many human beings deny <laughs> that God has created them and, and they have a glorious future in that new world that is coming. And uh, that's why in the Old Testament, uh, we have, for example, in some of the Psalms, uh, Psalm 98 here, uh, even under the Old Covenant, let the sea roar, <laughs> and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands, <laughs> uh, and let the hills sing for joy forever before the Lord, for He comes to judge the world. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So the, the creation knows that uh, there's a better day coming. And so they acknowledge the Father and the Son together in this creative work. And perhaps no text expresses this more helpfully for us than Paul, again in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 8, and verse 5 and 6, for although, he says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, as indeed there are many gods in inverted commas and many lords in inverted commas, yet for us, that is for us Christians who believe the Bible and uh, serve God truly, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Uh, well, that's our Christian view, isn't it, of uh, reality uh, and of the universe and of our planet. We are here as part of a divine plan and purpose, 
and it's all good. And uh, we acknowledge in the creation and coming into being and the sustaining and the guidance and directing of this planet to this glorious new creation that is coming, uh, the activity of the Father and the Son, the Father through the Son. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, is not just our mediator in redemption, but he's also our mediator in creation. The Father always acts not alone, but through the Son and by the Holy Spirit. That's the order, and it's a perfect blending of divine agency and energy, and it brings forth praise and glory to God. So here is the song of creation, and uh, the, the whole creation stands up to praise our God. And uh, Paul does that in his great letter to the Romans, and this is the passage I was referring to in Romans chapter 8, which we read. It includes the whole of creation. This is our Christian view. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So the whole creation is looking forward to and looking forward to sharing in the glory and the eternal life and the splendor of the children of God when Jesus comes. And that's the scope of our doctrine of salvation. And I just want to say that all too often, I think, evangelical Christians who take the Bible as their word of truth and authority, all too often we have presented and preached a narrow gospel. That is, we've reduced it to the individual. And uh, we've reduced the way of salvation to the individual. But the Bible, the New Testament, in passages like these and in our text this morning is reminding us that the gospel of salvation is so much greater. It's broad, it has breadth as well as depth. And we need to include the whole of creation because our Savior is the creator. When Jesus came into this world, he didn't just come for his people. He came for his creation. God and the Father and Jesus Christ love the work of their hands. And the gospel is about the measures taken by the Creator God to redeem and to restore all that He created in the beginning. And this is our gospel. This is our hope, Paul says. We don't see it yet, but we believe in it, and we will wait for it to come. And uh, it's already happening in our hearts and in our lives, the new creation. So let us give glory to the Lord and uh, rejoice in His purposes and in the word of the gospel uh, this morning, the last word that I would leave you with is the song there in verse 13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Or literally, it's for the ages of the ages. And that just leads me to say, Luke, this world, human history, is just one age. In some ways, it's the first age. But there are ages of ages still to come in the purpose and planning of God. And this is the folly, isn't it, of living for this age. Paul calls it this present evil age. This is Adam's age, a fallen world, a fallen age. And it ends in death and destruction. And that's the folly, isn't it, and the deceptiveness of sin that persuades so many people to live as though this age existed alone. There is no other age. Death is the end. But that is, that is untrue. 
uh, Christ has come to open up for us and to give us a share in the many ages of the ages to come. Uh, what are you living for? Are you living for this age, uh, for this world? Uh, where are your interests? Where do they lie? What do you pray for? Uh, these are the searching questions of the song of creation. Creation, even the inanimate parts of creation, are caught up in this hope, uh, this certain hope of a blessed and glorious future. And that's the call of Christ to us, uh, to live beyond this world, to live in the heavenly places, to set our affections on the things that are above. This world is passing away. We see it every day, don't we? In tragedy and death, in war and conflict, in injustice and cruelty. There's no heaven on earth. There's only a heaven in the new heaven and the new earth. And our Christian faith is taking us there. And Christ the Lamb is inviting us again this morning to cast in our lot with him so much better. And how thankful we'll be on that day when he appears that we made that choice, that we cast in our lot with him, whatever the cost. Amen. May God bless his word to us. We're going to sing the hymn in conclusion, <clears throat> 100, uh, 309, uh, Let the Saints on Earth Together Sing. <clears throat>